In this video, we're going to be talking about some useful tools and techniques to help you build iPhone interfaces. We're going to be looking at toolbars, alert views, text input traits, and gesture recognizers. So let's start by looking at toolbars. It's very easy to add an NS toolbar to our interface. We can add them at the top or the bottom of the screen. This contains an NS array of UI bar button items. Now we've got a choice where you can either add the toolbar and the buttons using the storyboard, or we can add them at runtime using code. You can also add other controls to the toolbars. So an example here, we've got three buttons on the bottom toolbar, and we've got a button and a progress bar in the top toolbar. Each UI bar button item, if you've got lots of bar button items, very tempting to create a separate IB action for every single bar button item on the toolbar, but this can clutter your code up a lot. So it's much better to create a single IB action for the first button, and then drag from the little circle back to each of the other buttons from the header file to assign the same action to multiple buttons. But obviously once you've done that, you need to know which button has been clicked on. The IP action it creates has a sender, and the sender has a title property. And the title property contains the NS string of the label on the button. We can use this information to decide which button's being clicked. Another useful control is the alert view, which is a UI alert view. And an alert view pops up modally on the screen and needs to be dismissed. Alert view can have one or more buttons, which allows the user to make a selection. If you have one or two buttons, then the layout of the buttons is horizontal. If you have more than two buttons, it switches to a vertical layout with one button per row. There are three steps in adding a UI alert view. So the first step is to implement the UI alert view delegate protocol, which you do in the header file to the right of the parent class. The next step is to create the alert view itself. It's a three-step process. We have to alloc init because we created the new UI alert view object. And once we've created the UI alert view, we need to call the show method to display it on the screen. The title and message are the text that appears at the top of the UI alert view and just underneath. The delegate is the object that will respond to the buttons being clicked. And in our case, we specify the delegate as the current class. We must specify a cancel button title. Now that's a bit of a misnomer because title button is actually the OK button. The cancel button is the easy way to get rid of the dialogue. And then you can specify zero or more other buttons by separating with commas. And after the last one, you can put a nil in there to specify there's no more buttons. Once you've implemented your UI alert view, we need to implement the delegate method to listen out for the buttons being clicked. The parameter in this delegate method, we have a button index which defines the index of the button that's being clicked. Index zero is always the cancel button, which we've called OK. And then the other buttons are specified in order. And you can see here an example of a switch statement, which allows you to very quickly choose between different options. Now, as we know, the iPhone has a virtual keyboard which gets triggered when the user clicks on certain user interface elements, such as text views and text fields. And what we're going to show you now is how to customize the appearance of that keyboard. There are four keyboard traits which we need to be aware of and understand. The keyboard type determines the buttons that appear on the keyboard. So you can have a numerical keyboard, you can have a Twitter keyboard, you can have a phone keyboard, and so on and so forth. The second trait is the return key type, is the text that appears on the return key. Now by default, the return key says enter on it, but you can have OK, Go, and so on. The third trait is capitalization. For example, do you want to capitalize every word? If you do put in someone's name in the field, for instance, or do you only want to capitalize sentences, or maybe you don't want to capitalize anything. And the fourth trait is the appearance. With iOS 7, you can have dark and light keyboards, and you can choose which style you want. These traits are properties of the 
control that you want the keyboard to attach to. So for example, in this one, I've got a text view and I've now got four properties of my text view which allows me to specify the different traits. Another important concept which people find difficult to understand is the idea of first responder. The current, the control that currently has focus, that the user is currently interacting with, has first responder status. And this is what causes the keyboard to automatically appear. If we want to get rid of the keyboard, we have to tell the control to resign its first responder status, which means it's no longer first responder. And as soon as it's no longer first responder, the keyboard will disappear. Every control that uses the keyboard has that method. And so for example, self.myText field, resign first responder, will remove the cursor from the text field, which will get rid of the keyboard. There are several ways to get rid of the keyboard. One is to add a button to the top of the keyboard to get rid of it. Another way is to use a gesture. But when the keyboard appears, if we're not careful, some of the text will be hidden behind the keyboard. So what we want to do is we want to change the size of the text view based on whether the keyboard's been displayed or not. To understand how we do this, we have to understand something called the frame property of a control. Every UI control occupies a rectangular space on the screen, and this is known as the frame. And every single control has a property to access this information. And the property contains a CG rect. Now, CG rect isn't an object, it's a C struct. It's part of the C programming language. It looks and behaves a bit like an object, but it's actually stored on the stack, not the heap. Let's look at the CG rec struct. In this example, I want to find out the dimensions of the screen. And this could be quite useful if you're rotating the device. So first of all, we say CG rec screen rec equals UI screen main screen bounds. And that, that method returns a CG rec. Once I've got the CG rec, I can retrieve the float value for the height and width of the screen by screen rec dot size dot width and screen rec dot size dot height. So you can see from here, I can retrieve the height and the width from a CG rect. But the CG rect actually contains four values. It contains an X and Y position and a height and a width. So you can define this position and size of any element on the screen. So let's have a go at changing the control size. What we have to do to change the size of a control, we have to create a CG rect struct and then assign it as the, as the frame property of the control. So here we have an example. I'm changing the text view so it has a width of 100 dps, a height of 200 dps, and it starts 50 dps from the left hand edge and 50 dps down from the top. So the four parameters are the x position, the y position, the width, and the height. So I can assign it to the frame of my text view and that will automatically resize that to the specified size and position. So let's go back to our issue with the keyboard. This is a two-step process. We have to implement the UI text view delegate, and then we have to implement two of the delegate methods so we know when the keyboard's going to appear and when it's going to disappear. So we implement the UI text view delegate in the usual way by specifying it in a header file to the right of the parent class. The two delegate methods we need to implement are text view did begin editing and text view did end editing. When text view did begin editing, we take the current size of the frame and we reduce the height by an amount to clear the keyboard. And then when we end editing, we simply take the current frame and add the amount. So it goes back to full screen. Now the amount we add is going to vary based on the other controls on the screen. And a lot of the time you have to do this by trial and error. And the trouble with the text view is you've got a white text view on a white screen, which means you can't see the bounds very well. So to fix that, it's a good idea when you're developing an application to assign a temporary background color to your text view so you can see as the text view frame changes. And what's really helpful is the keyboard's translucent, so if you've made your text frame too big, you'll see some of the color coming through from behind. So to change text and background color, we have to specify the view as opaque, which means it's not see-through. 
and then we specify the background color property and a text color property. And these are defined as UI color objects. And to create a UI color object, we call various class methods to define different colors. Now we've got a keyboard that appears on the screen and we can resize the text view to accommodate it. But by default, there's no way to get rid of the keyboard, so you're stuck with it. So there's several ways we could do this. We could add a toolbar to the top of the keyboard, but that's going to take up more screen space. Or we could, have button, put a, we could put a button somewhere. What we're going to do is cooler. We're going to implement a gesture recognizer. When the user's finished typing, they're going to swipe down to hide the keyboard. And you see this, these gestures used quite a bit in iOS applications. Now, a gesture recognizer is a, a control added to the project which detects finger gestures. And each one has different properties. And once you've created your gesture recognizer, you have to assign it to the control you want to assign it to. And there's lots of some gesture recognizers. There's tap, pinch, rotation, swipe, pan, long press. And any of these can be assigned to any of the UI controls. And what we do, we drag the gesture onto the storyboard, but the gesture sits in a little tray underneath the layout view. And you can see in this example, I have a swipe gesture recognizer, and it's between the red and the green buttons in the tray at the bottom. And there's only one property for a swipe gesture, and that is which direction is the swipe going to be? And we want to swipe down. So when the user swipes down, it's going to hide the keyboard. With a gesture, you need both an outlet and an action. The outlet's going to be the property that we attach to our control, and the action is going to be where we type the code that gets triggered when the gesture gets triggered. Every control has a method called add gesture recognizer. And if you want to add the swipe gesture we've just created, we simply, we simply specify that as the parameter. And once we've done that, we can implement the IB action. And all we have to do, if you think about it, from what we discussed earlier, is resign first responder on our control. And there we are, you've implemented your first gesture in iOS. But hold on, there's a slight problem here. With a text view, if the text gets longer in the, in the text view, when someone swipes up and down, it scrolls the text view so they can see the content. And by default, that will block your custom gesture recognizer. So we have to tell the code to accept multiple gestures on the same control. To do this, it's a two-step process. We have to implement the UI gesture recognizer delegate. And once we've done that, there's a delegate method which returns a Boolean to say whether it does or doesn't support multiple gestures. And this is probably the longest method name you've seen so far. Gesture recognizer should recognize simultaneously with gesture recognizer, and that returns yes or no as a Boolean. If you return yes, it will, it it will uh, detect multiple gestures. If you return no, then it will ignore your gesture if there's already a gesture associated with the control. And obviously that could be useful and important if there's going to be some clash between the different gestures. So we've covered quite a bit. We've covered the application settings. We've covered the asset catalog, how we add graphical assets to our project. We've covered auto layout, how we make sure the, the uh, screen works with different orientations and screen sizes. We've covered toolbars, we've covered text input traits, and we've also covered gesture recognizers. So lots to take on board.